On February 1, 2016, NASA's Super Guppy aircraft delivered the Orion spacecraft that would fly on Exploration Mission 1 to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Spaceflight Insider spoke with the vehicle's prime contractor, Lockheed Martin, to find out more about this upcoming test flight. Good afternoon, Spaceflight Insider fans. Jason Ryan here, and I am at the Neil A. Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I am joined by none other than the legendary Jules Schneider <laughs> with Lockheed Martin. Jules, thank you for joining us today. No problem. Glad to be here. Now, later on this afternoon, Lockheed Martin and NASA have a special delivery coming in. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? Well, what we're going to receive later this afternoon is the uh, pressure shell of the crew module for the Exploration Mission 1 mission, which is the next mission we're going to fly out of uh, KSC on an SLS. Now, that's pretty exciting. Because on that mission, you guys are actually going to go around the moon. And that leads us to, it's a big deal, because you guys got a lot of work ahead of you. Now, my, my question for you is, once that pressure vessel arrives at the ONC building, how soon will the engineers start actually working on it? Uh, right away, immediately. So today, it'll arrive today. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get it out of its transport vehicle, uh, bring it here to the ONC building and then we'll immediately load it into its structural assembly tool, which is right behind us here, mm -hmm. and then we'll start assembling its primary structure right away. Wow, I mean, just like that, almost today. the same day. Yes. Oh, wow. Now, one of the unique aspects, at least at this point for EM-1, is that its service module, it's gonna be made by European Space Agency, correct? Well, a significant portion of the service module is being provided by the European Space Agency in, in a, an agreement that NASA uh, developed with them. Um, we will receive the first unit or the EM-1 version of that uh, about a year from now, about okay. uh, Fe January or February of 2017. It'll show up here at the ONC building and we will integrate it into the rest of the service module and then it'll keep moving into the in the flow and get integrated into the into the spacecraft. Now for our shuttle hub huggers out there, there's, there's a few of us shuttle huggers still in existence. We got really used to seeing those black tiles in the bottom of the orbiter and then we saw EFT-1 fly, it had the black tiles on the outside, it kind of was reminiscent of that. Now, the coating on the EM-1 Orion isn't going to be that black tile, it's going to be the shiny metallic uh, coating. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. We'll still use the black tiles uh, as the thermal protection system on the, the back shell panels for the crew module, the mm -hmm. conical section. And the, the TPS system on the heat shield will be the same as EFT-1. It'll be an ablative material. The difference is on EFT-1, we did put a metallic tape on it to coat it. And we're going to now extend that metallic tape coating up all the way to the front end of the vehicle. Okay. And the, the metallic tape uh, serves an electrical um, purpose. Uh, on re-entry, uh, we pick up a lot of uh, electrical charge on the outside of the spacecraft, and the metallic tape is used to dissipate that charge. Now, EFT-1 was the first flight of Orion back in December 2014, and you guys flew that for a variety of reasons, and you learned a lot of lessons from that. What lessons on EFT-1 have been implied in the design of the EM-1 Orion? Yeah, that's actually so many, it's too numerous to actually <laughs> list, but I can tell you that all of the all of the learning that took place on EFT-1, and there was an enormous amount, not only on the design of the flight structure itself, but the processing of the vehicle through this facility, all of our tooling, our processes, uh, our workforce even, all of that was a was a first time for Orion, and we learned a tremendous amount, and we've incorporated, uh, like I said, um, too many to count, but uh, an enormous amount of learning uh, from EFT-1 has gone into what we're about to do for EM-1. Now that raises a good point. Uh, how different are EFT-1 Orion and EM-1 Orion from one another? Well, um, not hugely different, only in that we keep adding capability. Okay. So. We proved out a lot of things on EFT-1 for Orion, but there were a lot of things we couldn't get on EFT-1. Now we're putting more capability into the system. And keep in mind, EFT-1 was a four and a half hour mission. EM-1 is a 21 day mission. 21 around days. Around the moon, correct. And so we've got much more, uh, I'll say, of the Orion systems on board, and we're gonna prove them out over a much longer period of time this time. Now, there's been some attempts by uh, members of the media, the public, to kind of compare because it's a capsule-based design, the Apollo Command and Service Module to the Orion 
command and service module. Just on the on the broadest of, of strokes, there. Tell us how different those two craft are from one another. Well, I think what you what you have to do to understand the the difference is the the Apollo uh, system was designed for a very specific mission: go to the moon, land there, come back, and and re-enter and return folks safely. The Orion system is designed for a much bigger, broader set of missions. So our capability has to be much more flexible and more broad-based because we're not one mission driven. We have to be able to satisfy multiple deep space missions. For each Orion, maybe on the crewed missions, and this might be something NASA has to address, will they be given names? You know, that's a great question. I don't know that yet. Um, so far, EFT-1 did not get a name other than Exploration Flight Test 1, and mm -hmm. so far, EM-1 has not that I know of, but I would, I would imagine that eventually NASA will start naming them. I don't know if they'll wait until they get into a production phase or a crewed flight for EM-2, but so far, not yet, but I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting the first name. Now, for EM-1, like you said, it's going to travel around the moon, 21-day mission, and we know that for the ARM mission, the Asteroid Redirect mission, NASA's planning on grabbing an asteroid, basically putting it in a lunar orbit. Uh, I'm imagining EM-1's already kind of packed with tests and things you guys have to do anyway. Will anything be done on EM-1 to kind of serve to pathfind, if you will, for ARM? Yeah, not that I know of. I don't think, I, I don't know of any specific uh, EM-1 objectives that directly are replicable to the ARM mission or directly derived from is what I was looking for, directly derived from the ARM mission. Um, I would imagine some of the capability we're going to demonstrate will be needed during the ARM mission, but I can't tell you that there are objectives that are directly traceable to that. Okay. You know, once EM-1 comes back, is there any plans to refly the spacecraft? Uh, no, not that I know of. They'll, th there are plans to refly selected components. Uh, some of, I, I believe, maybe the avionics, uh, could be removed and reflown, or is planned to be, but for the EM-1 vehicle itself, there isn't a, a plan to refly it. Now, what are some of the biggest milestones that you say in 2016 that the public should be keeping their eye out for? Well, we have the first big milestone we'll, we'll come across is a structural proof test. So what happens is the vehicle, the, the pressure shell comes in today, mm -hmm. we have to outfit it with the remaining uh, primary and secondary mechanically attached structure. Once that's done, we have to go proof test the welds that are in the system. And so we'll go do that around the April, March, April time frame. Then after that, uh, we have a little bit of cleanup to do on the structure. And then we'll go into the clean room and we'll integrate the propulsion system and the environmental control life support systems. And then we have to proof test those welds. And so there'll be a second structural proof test in the August, September time frame. And then, really what is a, a huge milestone for us, it happens just past the end of 2016 into early 2017, is when we will do an initial power on of the vehicle. That's the first time EM-1 will see power on the spacecraft. All right, and our last question does come from one of our readers, and it's probably one of the more specific questions that we have. Uh, would it be better to launch EM-2 to low Earth orbit and launch another mission to lunar orbit in, say, the 2023 time frame with SLS Block 1B. Yeah, I think what the reader is referring to there is SLS Block 1B is going to have the, I'll say, tailored upper stage versus the one we're going to fly on EM-1. But to get back to the question, I, I think the answer is no. I don't really see the value of launching Orion into low Earth orbit because that's not what our mission is. Orion really has no mission in low Earth orbit. Uh, Orion's mission is uh, beyond that deep space. Well, Jules, again, this is a busy day for you. Allow us to congratulate Lockheed Martin on getting the pressure vessel to Kennedy. We're pretty excited about seeing it arrive later this afternoon. I know that your schedule has got to be incredibly busy today, and we want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to Space Flight Insider. No problem. It was my pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you.